Lupus LA would like to thank our generous sponsors for their support of the Your Story, Our Fight podcast. Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals is focused on managing complexity and improving lives. Emerge Business Solutions serves as a personal and professional CFO for clients across a wide spectrum of industries. They handle financial affairs with integrity and transparency. Gemini Beauty believes in beauty for a cause, and in their case, the cause is lupus. The team at Gemini is changing the skincare game for good. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Lupus LA podcast, Your Story, Our Fight. I'm your host, Adam Selkowitz, and as always, thanks to our sponsors for keeping us on the air and uh, past uh, over 40 episodes now. So um, we appreciate that and look forward to telling you another story today. Uh, and that's the story of Alma Torres. Alma is joining us. She is a special education teacher diagnosed with lupus uh, in 2009. And Alma's story has, uh, you know, a tough element to it. Alma also had a younger sister with lupus who unfortunately passed away. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to explore that. Uh, you know, genetics and lupus is one of those challenging areas that there's no definitive answers in some cases. And um, But obviously, we all know there is a genetic element uh, to the disease. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Alma. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, Adam. Um, thank you for allowing us to have a platform really to be able to share our stories and really to just connect um, with other patients, caregivers. Um, so thank you and Lupus LA for allowing this opportunity. Excellent. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. And so tell me, um, where'd you grow up? How'd you grow up? How'd you and your sister grow up? together and, and then when did lupus kind of enter the picture? Yeah, so um, I grew up um, in a small city in the San Gabriel Valley, um, Almani. Um, I grew up in Almani. I spent uh, all my years there as a young child, middle school, high school. Um, you know, my sister and I are um, 11 years apart. So, you know, when I was graduating high school on my way to college, she was just barely hitting like teenage years. So mm -hmm. um, our relationship when we were younger was a little different just because we were in different places in our lives. Um, you know, I, I left to go to college. I decided to go to um, La Jolla, to UCSD, um, which, you know, culturally is was a little shock in our family. Um, I am of like Mexican descent. So typically we stay close to home. Um, it isn't very common at least in my family, it wasn't um, common to have someone kind of up and leave. But, you know, ultimately it was a decision that I knew I had to make to just kind of move forward and uh, really get ahead in life and um, get to where I wanted to be. So, you know, I did a lot of like kinder first grade pickup for my sister because I was older. Um, right. Really our relationship kind of, um, you know, grew stronger when she moved in with me years later. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. we, I had already been living with lupus for, um, you know, about four years before she was diagnosed. So I already knew uh, a little bit about it. Um, I knew a lot as far as advocating, um, advocating for yourself as a patient. Um, I knew a lot more about the disease and how it kind of manifested. But to be honest, our lupus, like you probably heard before, Adam, um, it's very different. Very mm -hmm. different. Well, so wait, go go back to me for one second. Just start. So you moved. You went down to college. When were you diagnosed? And where, yeah, where, 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 where does that so fall? I moved down to college in two thousand three, and it actually really started in college. When I look back, um, I had a lot of like illnesses. I was sick. I had like. Um, low platelet count, which they initially diagnosed as ITP. You know, I really just uh, kind of thought I'm stressed. This is new. I'm away from home. I didn't really experience any other symptoms. I'm sure this is just something that's like, uh, um, like a process I have to go through and everything's going to be fine. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would come back to visit. I still had my primary doctor here in um, Monterey Park. I still remember him. 
Um, he was an amazing primary doctor. And it was actually him who initially noticed some some strange like rash on my body, um, which, you know, he called petechiae. And he's mm-hmm. like, do you get this often? Is this something, you know, that uh, happens to you a lot? And I'm kind of just like, I, you know, I, I never really noticed. So um, I did start to kind of pay a little bit more attention. And then when I would come and see him, I, I'd kind of tell him, yeah, you know, it's happening. And he's like, well, you know, you have low platelet count, low white blood cells. Let's just get you to see a hematologist just in case. Mm-hmm. Um, So I I really started that route with the hematologist initially. And really there was nothing um, that I was prescribed. It was more just, I guess, like a monitoring, making sure I was okay Um, up until 2009 um, is when I feel like I started to really experience these symptoms that I was like, this isn't normal. Um, You know, I'm at the time I'm 24 years old. I'm like this this isn't stress. This isn't, um, you know, right. it just didn't seem right. Um, and I remember I took a trip with, uh, my two older sisters and my mom and my aunt, we took a trip to Vegas and, you know, we were just there on vacation and, um, I just did not feel well. I, I didn't feel well. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't get out of bed the whole vacation. So initially, I just thought, oh, maybe it's a cold or something I'm coming down with. I went to go see my doctor, same doctor I had. And um, he was such a good doctor. I really do think that, um, you know, when you find like a gem in the medical field, um, it, it's, it's really important because when you're heard as a patient and you're understood as a patient, um, you really do make a lot of progress Um, with whatever you're dealing with. Um, Fortunately for me, I have had experiences where maybe, um, you know, the doctors are always just really thinking about what I'm saying as a patient, understanding me. So this particular doctor, you know, I just told him and he was like, yeah, I don't, I don't really like what I'm hearing. I think I want you to see a rheumatologist. And at the time I'm like, what, isn't that like for people with arthritis? And Mm -hmm. he's like, yes but no um and you know you have you there's no reason why you should be in so much pain like with your joints and you know your muscles like the, it's just not adding up so again i thought i really did think it was going to be like my experience with the hematologist where it was just going to be a monitoring it was going to be just just fine i always just felt like yeah, there's something wrong with me, but they're never going to figure it out. And that's okay. I'm just mm-hmm. living my life. Um, yeah, that's an interesting. Um, I, I bet a lot of people feel that way. Like, cause you can't quite describe exactly how you're feeling. And so you think nobody else will figure it out. And, and you just kind of say, well, I can moderate my life around it. Um, okay. So that's, so you go to see the rheumatologist. Yeah. And the rheumatologist, you know, does all these tests, runs all these things, all these markers and everything. And I give him my history of the ITP and the low platelet and all of that. Um, And then my symptoms, which really at the time were like uh, the joint pain, which was like really unbearable. Um, I was working, but I would just force myself like to get up. I had to get up. I had to go to work. Uh, The chest pain, um, you know, the chest pain where you kind of have to sleep sitting up. because you feel like you can't breathe. And he was just like, you know, um, based on everything you're telling me, I want to see if, you know, you're someone who has lupus. And I was just like, what, what is that? What is, what is lupus? Mm-hmm. Um, I had never heard the name. I, I didn't know what it was. There was no one in my family history with it. There, nothing. So of course, you know, I, I start, going down the rabbit hole of Google and, you know, what is this? Like, can you live with this? Do people survive from this? So, um, you know, I think at that point I was like, oh, wow. Um, This isn't just like a temporary thing. This is like a lifelong thing. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I, sure enough, you know, I I get my results. I see him and he's like, yeah, you have lupus. Um, There are different types and you have this one. And, 
I have to start you on this medication and this steroid. And, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, wait a second. Um, like, I, I was just kind of like, I thought this was going to be like a routine. Just, let's just watch you. And he's like, oh, no, because your inflammation levels are really high. You know, he's explaining all this stuff to me. And I'm just kind of like, well, can you can you die from this? Like, I, I'm just really lost, right? Um, luckily he was also a really good rheumatologist and he was like, you know what, let me connect you with one of our nurses. She can answer your questions. You can talk a little more with her. And I was like, okay, perfect. Um, which is what they did. And, but to be honest, Adam, I always felt like I'm fine. Like the first few years. I'm not sure that Mm -hmm. they know what they're talking about. Like I know something's wrong, but I don't think it's what they're saying. Did you take all the met? Did you do? Did you follow the instructions that they gave you, and then sort of said that, or did you skip the medicines? No, so I did follow the instructions. Um, okay, and then like I, I call it now like I I played doctor. You know, I thought mm-hmm. like oh, well, I'll just stop taking this. I'm sure I'll be fine, and I was for a few months, and then, and then the hospital, um, the hospitalization started to come, and I was like. Oh man. And then, and then I did feel, I would feel like kind of embarrassed. Like they'd be like, so did you stop your medicine? I was like, yes, because it was like, I just did. I just don't know what to do. You know, I I really did feel Mm -hmm. like I'm putting something in my body. They say you shouldn't take it, but it's going to make me better. So I just had a lot of, um, a lot of questioning and doubt. So I was like, I think I'll be okay. Um, and obviously I don't recommend that. And I know that, you know, 11 years later, 12 years later, but, um, I think because there was so little out there and it wasn't really talked about that. I just, I just didn't, I didn't really know where to go. So then I started to really do, um, just more research and finding lupus LA and, um, support groups. And I was like, okay, this is, this is a real thing. This isn't like a fake thing, Alma. This is something you have to get it together or you're not going to be able to live the life you want to live. True. I mean, I think that's not, yeah. And it's not an uncommon thing for people to play doctor. You know, you're feeling well, you're just taking this one little pill or a couple of little pills a day. And it's like, well, what if I don't take, you know, and, and it does, it, it takes a little while, I think for the ramifications of that to set in. But I, I think that's a lesson I hope they learn it from listening to you, but I think everybody kind of goes through that at one point or another, Um, especially when you've been a lupus patient for a long time and they keep adding to your medicines like, oh, well, you have this thing now, take this and then take that. So you, you know, you go from two to three medicines to seven to eight to 10 medicines. And then you think, well, do I really need all of these and all these vitamins and all these supplements? But then it becomes sort of this unwielding, you know, inner interaction with everything. And, and I, I, but I think that's a very common um, situation that people put themselves in and, and um, you know, luckily you've sort of balanced it out and sort of figured it out and, and, um, and seem to be doing quite well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think honestly, I, I kind of, you know, you just have to really change your mindset and your mentality um, because I, in my eyes, I'm like, I'm, 24 I'm 25 I'm I'm trying to finish school start my new job this whatever this is I have is not helping me like I I I just think I look back and I just felt like um I I think I felt more angry like I'm just trying to do what I need to do to like get ahead um to start my career and you know why are you not letting me like just kind of mm-hmm. let me be um, but in the midst of all that, I, I learned a lot. I learned about, um, the importance of taking time for myself and listening to my body. I wasn't really listening to my body. I wasn't resting when I had to, I wasn't saying no when I had to, um, you know, I, I, I think it was a little bit of that denial, like, mm-hmm. you know, where you just kind of feel like this isn't really something that I have. Um, I could deal with this differently. 
And, you know, it took me about three years to finally say, you know what, if you continue this, if you don't listen to your body and stop and take time off work when you need to, you are going to keep staying in this cycle over and over where you feel mm -hmm. good, you're doing well, you, you think everything is fine, you let your guard down, and now you're back to square one. So, you know, I, I really, my first year that I worked, I was, I was in the hospital at the end of the school year. And I was just like, I can't do this. I can't have my dream job and think I'm 100% healthy. I need, I need to change my mindset and I need to understand that it's okay. It's okay to, um, you know, really have something, a disease that a lot of people don't know about. Um, it's okay to talk about it and it's okay to say like, I can't do that today or I can't go with you after all. Um, mm -hmm. because you really do have to sometimes, um, be selfish in a sense, but not because you want to let people down or not show up for them. It's because if you don't show up for yourself, you know what the consequences are. And I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no. And I think that's really, um, you know, I, I can remember it was about two, 2012 and I was like, you, you've got to figure this out, Alma. You have to change, you know, your perspective. And um, does not mean that you can't do things you want to do? It just means you might have to look at it differently, plan it out differently. Um, just really take a little bit more time to figure it out and what works for you even if that's not what works for everyone else and that's okay. Yeah. No, I think, I think you make a lot of good points at your, uh, you definitely can put that into perspective for a lot of people. And, um, I want to now talk, I want to switch and talk about Alondra, your sister. Um, but I want to take a break first and then we're going to come back and I want to hear her story and then talk about, you know, what that meant to you and, and your family and, and, uh, and all that. So uh, we will be right back uh, with more from Alma Torres. Please visit our online store at lupusla.org. By purchasing Lupus LA products, you are directly supporting lupus patients and their families. For more information, visit lupusla.org. We are back with the Lupus LA podcast, Your Story, Our Fight. We're talking to Alma Torres today. And um, so this is the part in your story that gets really difficult. At se age 17, at, in 2014, your sister, uh, Alondra, was diagnosed with lupus. So, so tell me the circumstances around that. Um, how much did she know about your lupus when she was diagnosed? And, and sort of what was the timeline there? Yeah, so um, to be honest, Adam, with my lupus, um, I lived away from home. I lived on my own. Um, my family saw that I was, uh, that something was going on. You know, I would come over and I would be tired. I'd need to just sleep. They were very respectful, but um, they didn't really understand. I think we were kind of just working it out together um, as a family, and they were giving me my space. Um, my boyfriend, husband, now at the time was uh, very understanding. He also knew that I needed um, a lot. I needed to rest a lot. I, you know, there were just things that my family was like, oh, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll figure this out together. It's mm -hmm. interesting you ask about my little sister because um, I used to go to my mom's house because I would have to leave work early um, because I just couldn't stay. Um, and this happened for mm -hmm. a while. And she would tell me, I would get so mad at you because when you would come over, my mom would tell us, don't make any noise because Alma's sleeping. So don't wake her up. And she told me that her and my younger niece would be so mad because they just wanted to play and be loud <laughs> but that my mom would tell them, you know, keep it down. Um, don't wake her up. You know, she needs to rest. So, you know, I, I would just tell her, you know, we would just laugh about it now, but, um, you know, she, she didn't really know much beyond that. Um, mm -hmm. and then when I would be like in the hospital, they would know, oh, Alma's lupus is, 
was acting up, something's going on, you know. Um, and then she moved in with me, um, circumstances changed for our family and um, my husband and I had the opportunity to get a bigger home and um, my sister moved in with us. Uh, she had she was just about to turn 17 and start her senior year. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, we, we had a relationship, but it was very different because I was older, mm -hmm. she was younger. Now, um, you know, I'm, I, I think I was like 27 and she was about to be 17. So we started to build a relationship together again. And, and it was really nice um, spending time together, going out to eat together. Um, I hadn't had my son yet. So a lot of my time was devoted to her really and just kind of mm -hmm. getting to know her. Um, you know, I'm a strong believer that everything happens for a reason and, um, timing is everything. So I, when she moved in with me, um, I had one last ho hospitalization, November of 2013. And she was really okay. scared. She was like, what is this? What's going on? I'm like, oh, don't worry, sister. You know, like we, I take my medicine, we go to the doctor, you know, all of that. And then about a month later, um, I noticed on her legs, she had petechiae. And I mm -hmm. was like, Alondra, how long have you had this, this on your legs? And she's like, I don't know, maybe like a few weeks. I'm like, okay, let's just keep an eye on it. And then mm -hmm. about a month later, um, she just told me she, she couldn't sleep because her chest hurt. And I was like, what do you mean? Like how? She's like, I just feel like this heavy, like, like brick on my chest. And I was like, okay, in my mind, I am already like, whoa, right. Sounds very similar to, you know, but again, I, I don't want to scare her. I don't, you know, I'm just kind of like, you should go to your doctor, go to your mm -hmm. doctor, um, you know, and, and see what's going on. So she goes to her doctor. And like I mentioned earlier, Diff different doctor different than you doctor. had totally. Right. Okay. Doctor. Yeah. So, um, she goes to her doctor and like I mentioned earlier, you know, you have some doctors that are really good doctors who listen and care. Um, and you have some doctors who sometimes just want to get you in and out. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. she saw one of those doctors and he told her, mm -hmm. you know, from your symptoms and what it sounds like and what you're going through, I think you're depressed. Um, oh God. Yeah. So she came and told me that. And, um, you know, my family's like, how could she be depressed? You know, I was like, Hold, no, 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 wait. So I started the process of switching her primary doctor to my, to, to the doctor mm -hmm. I had. Okay. Um, I, Cause I still had him. Um, so we took her there. Um, he ran tests. He asked, he was patient. He knew about the history right away, sent her to the same rheumatologist. Did it wait? There was no, it was like, mm -hmm. here's your authorization, you know, aside from having to wait for that ran test and yeah, it, that's what it was in. And, um, you know, in the moment it was scary. And she's like, wait, is this, this is what you have. And I'm like, yes, th it is. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, to be honest, Adam, she had already kind of seen like that there was, there was like light at the end of the tunnel. It it wasn't right. Like a, you were doing well, except for the you know occasional yes, yeah setback, so, etc. Yes. Right. So she was like, okay, all right. Well, what do we do? I'm like, yes. What do we do? How do we do this together? Right. Um, you know, and and the whole time, I think everything that happened to me, um, again, just thinking like timing, like I was at my best during the time she was at her worst. So mm. the yeah. years that she was just very, very sick, I was in remission. I was in remission. I wasn't on any medication. I, I was doing great. I was still going to see my doctor, but my time and energy shifted to her. Um, like you said, everything happens for that reason, right? And um, so how did her disease progress given that she had the same rheumatologist and same, you know, how did it progress in a different way? So her lupus was very aggressive. Um, it automatically attacked her, her lungs. 
it automatically attacked her brain. It just, mm. it would just not let up. Um, her senior year, she, she missed a lot of class cause she had to stay home with me and sleep. And she graduated, um, you know, made the decision to go to UCR and, um, you know, we started that journey and within the first semester, she was back home. Um, she had, yeah. you know, pulmonary embolism, had to get on blood thinners, was always on medication. So it was different for me because mm -hmm. I had periods of time where my rheumatologist was like, good news, you know, you, you can taper down, no more steroids, no more. I was like, great, you know, this is awesome. Um, it was very different for her because mm -hmm. there was never that opportunity. And I do think I really learned from me playing doctor. Um, mm -hmm. I just told her that's not an option. We, we cannot do that. We listen to our doctor's advice because you do not want to mess with any of the dosage, any of anything until we talk with your doctors. Oh, but I feel fine. I think, and I'm like, no, not an option. We have to, you know, so I, mm -hmm. I think about it and I'm like, Smart. you know, I, I, I feel like I had to go through the bumps and the bruises and the learning of things to really be able to genuinely um, tell her like, it's not a good idea and we're not going to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, you know, she, it attacked her lungs. She came home from UCR. Um, obviously she was very devastated and, um, didn't want to leave school. She's always been like goal oriented, had to take a year off. Um, but then she started again at uh, a community college by our house. So, you know, I just think uh, our, our, our relationship just really grew so much with in an unfortunate situation or with unfortunate how could I say it? Like it, it, it wasn't ideal, but the circumstances, yeah, yeah. circumstances were not ideal, but we're bonding about doctor's appointments, medication, uh, symptoms, conferences, support groups. We found the looms for lupus. Um, we saw the Mata sisters at one of the conferences yeah. and we went up to them and we were like, Hey, you know, and they're like, yes, come. And we started going to the support group in person and, you know, we really just yeah. give each other support group, us two and the rest of our family. Um, and, and things were going great. And, and she was not in remission, but she was doing well and went back to school. And, and then in 2016, right before she turned 20, she had a stroke. So, mm. you know, um, that, that time in our life was really scary, very scary. So at that time, honestly, Adam, I felt like it's hard because you, you want to take care of yourself. Cause I knew I still had lupus. This wasn't like a, Oh, I, I I'm better. I'm all done. I'm cured. But I also knew right. I have to be strong and I have to make sure that, um, I let her know, like, everything's going to be okay because her lupus was so aggressive. And I, I think at times I, I, I even felt lost, you know, I was just like, did she fully recover from the stroke or did that really be, was that a turning point for her? So at the time, um, she did. So she, she fully recovered where she got all her function back. She was able to speak again. She was able to move again. Cause it really did, um, you know, debilitate her. She, her whole left side was just, um, she couldn't, mm -hmm. she couldn't function really. So, um, we, we did a lot of rehab. We went to, um, CHLA, which, you know, mm -hmm. she was able to go because even though she was an adult, you know, they take people, I think it was up to 22. Um, mm -hmm. we advocated through her insurance and she spent, uh, I think about two weeks there at the hospital, um, inpatient receiving all the therapies and she came home still needing like help with things, but, um, she was here with us and, you know, we, we helped her kind of healed her back and, but she had to take another, uh, semester off of school. So mm -hmm. 
I think that. Was- so then, so so what are the circumstances then? So she recovers from the stroke, and then, you know, I think so. In twenty twenty, she passed away, right? Yes. So how did that come about? Because I feel like it's always tough for me when somebody is, you know, being managed with good doctors and good care and still their outcome, uh, you know, isn't a positive one. And I think our audience, obviously that's everybody, every lupus patient's biggest fear, right? Is that something, you know, gets out of control. Um, So tell us a little bit about that, those circumstances. Yeah. So I think um, we learned that I think there's a specific term for it, lupus cerebritis, uh, okay. where, where it attacks your brain. Mm-hmm. So we learned back in 2016 that this was possibly something that she had, but because this was the first occurrence, we didn't really know, you know, the doctors didn't really know um, if that's what was happening or not, or if it was just a one-time mm-hmm. thing because of the inflammation. Um, so after her her stroke, she did well. You know, she had a few situations here and there where, you know, she had to um, go to the hospital or figure something out. Um, and then in 2020, with everything that happened with COVID, um, I just, I, I things were different. It wasn't mm-hmm. as easy to see a doctor if you had symptoms like chest pain, it wasn't really like a, okay, stay here overnight so we could monitor you. It was very much like go home, monitor Mm -hmm. yourself, make sure, you know, you call your primary doctor. Um, But to be honest, Adam, I think, I think her body was just internally just, just shutting down little by little um, day after day, week after week, um, even with the medication, even with, the great um, doctors she had. I just think it was just too much for her Mm -hmm. whole body in general. And then right before she passed away, she had another little like mini stroke, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it was the same thing. It was like the inflammation. They had to let her leave, you know, because of COVID. Um, They were worried that she would get sick in the hospital So we were home here, just quarantined. She was healthy for about a week or so. And then, and then something just changed. She's just like, I just Mm -hmm. don't feel good. I just don't feel good. And I'm like, well, what is it? Is it your chest? Is it your, you can't breathe? You can't, you know, and I'm kind of like panicking. Like, what what do you mean? You don't feel good. She's like, I just, I just don't feel good. My body just doesn't feel good. And I was like, okay, Hmm. go to the hospital, see what they say. They did a chest x-ray. Everything was fine. No pneumonia because she always kind of suffered from pneumonia. Came home that night and still same thing. I just, I don't feel good. So then she was kind of scared. Like maybe I have COVID, you know, and I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, let's, let's have you kind of just quarantine and we'll get you a COVID test tomorrow. Um, you know, so I, I can't really explain it. I don't really know. Um, I know our family spent a long time and we still kind of talk about it. Like if things were different in the medical world, would things be different um, for her? But to be honest, I, I just saw her um, that last month with what happened again and having to then she was going to start like infusions with like the chemo, um, one of the chemo medications mm-hmm. that they have. Um, right. It really just kind of changed her. I could kind of see she mm-hmm. just kind of like she felt a little like just defeated, just kind of like mm-hmm. I'm 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 done. Like I'm she just kind of it just kind of felt like I'm tired of this. And mm-hmm. and I was like, yeah, I I get it. I get it um to some extent. But again, I, I didn't feel like I really understood because like I said, my lupus was completely different than hers. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just think, um, you know, I just think she was she was tired and her body was tired of fighting. And um, and I think it was just it was just her time to just rest and be done with all of this and, you know, back and forth. So. And so. 
how does how does her passing away? I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss and for your family's loss. And how does how does something like that impact you? I, I know it impacted the whole family, but you, her sister, who she lives with, who also has the same illness. Um, did you did you change your lifestyle? Or did you get do you get more? especially during COVID, I'm assuming there's just a lot that, that goes through your mind at that point. Yeah. I mean, I think honestly, Adam, the lifestyle change happened with both of us, like watching our diet, making sure we're exercising, um, making sure we're following like all of our doctor's recommendations. Um, you know, but for me, it really just it allowed me to just focus more on myself um and on my son you know and all of this I had I had my son and um Mm -hmm. just really continuing to advocate for myself as a patient um and making sure that I ask all the questions because I strongly believe that as a patient of any disease you should have the right to ask every single question you want um and you should be comfortable doing it so mm-hmm. I, I do that more with like a keen eye. Like, I want to know what this is. I would like to know what the options are. I feel like I've always really done that. Um, but more so now I'm kind of just like, this isn't a, I want to, it isn't like a gotcha. It isn't like a, you don't know what you're doing. This is like a, I want to have a relationship with you because right. I want to be able to call you as my rheumatologist, as my hematologist, and you know my story and ta- and give me the best advice you can possibly give me so that mm-hmm. I know that what I'm doing is correct or not correct. Um, because I think that I don't, I want to see it more as like a, a, a personal relationship than just you're my doctor. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I just think that that's really- no, I think I it makes total sense and I think it's incredibly good advice to people. I think um I think you're absolutely right. You have a right to ask any question you want in that appointment. Uh you know, you're paying for it, insurance is paying for it or whatever it is, but but that's your time to really and we always tell people write a list so you don't leave and go, "Oh, wait, I had one more thing to say." Yeah. Uh I think that's I think that's really impo- important. So so since your sister's passed, um, what's your what's your sort of outlook now? You know, looking forward twenty twenty three and beyond, kind of about your lupus and and your, um, you know, and what and what do you think your sister's legacy is? You know, I think I think it's very impactful in the lupus world for sure. But but how do you sum that up? I mean, for me, honestly, Adam, it's just continuing to advocate for myself as a patient, continuing to know that there is help out there. There are resources. You are not alone. Um, You know, even though sometimes it does feel like you're alone, like nobody understands. um, There's a Mm -hmm. whole group of people out there um, who understand. And, um, you know, with my sister's legacy, I just think, I just always think like, she just never gave up, you know, she never, she never complained. She, it just was the way things were for her. Um, And that's why I know at the end it was different for her because I can see it in her face. I can see it in the way she was letting me know, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but I, I can still, you know, I, when I have my flares, because it's been a hard year. This past year was really hard for me, um, being in remission so long and then um, not being in remission and having to deal with all these symptoms again that I hadn't experienced mm-hmm. in probably five or six years. Um, I just can still hear her. I can still, like, you know, have her telling me, like, you got this. Like, yes, life is hard, but you got this. You're tough. Like, you can do this, like just kind of the same way we would always um, empower one another and guide one another through this disease, to be honest. Um, it's different for me now because I don't 
physically have her here, but I always know like that she's always going to be rooting for me um, to make sure that I take care of myself and that um, I don't, you know, that I don't take any time I have here for granted, being sick or not, feeling at my worst or feeling at my best, I do not take it for granted. Um, and I will never take it for granted. I think that's one of the biggest things is um, it's easy for us to, you know, complain or feel. And those are valid complaints because we hurt and it hurts mm -hmm. and it's hard. Um, but I always just have that mindset. I'm still here. I'm still here to fight. I'm still here to um, struggle through this, problem solve through it, get better. I don't know, but I'm still here. I'm still here to do that, and I will never take that for granted, even on my worst days when I can't move my body in the morning. I I just I won't take it for granted. I will always see, like, the positive in it, and that's just kind of how I feel because I'm still able to feel all these things, even if they hurt. Yeah. Well, I... I'm really, I'm proud of you for sharing this story with the Lupus LA podcast audience. Um, Alondra has made an impact on me and I think she's going to make an impact on, on our audience and beyond. And so have you. And um, it's an incredibly moving story and I want to thank you for sharing it with us today. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank again, like I said, Adam earlier, I think, when I feel at my lowest, when I feel um, like, how can I keep living like this? Why do I need to take this medication or this? I honestly, I listen to the podcast and I really just think, um, you know, we're, we're not alone and no story is the same, which is amazing, but there are so many similarities mm -hmm. with the things that, um, you know, we have to face that sometimes the world doesn't see and that's okay, um, but we see, we see as a community, and we know, and um, you know, I think that that's a beautiful thing. Um, my only regret is not being able to sit next to my sister to be able to share together. Um, but I'm so thankful and feel so honored to even be able to mention her name um, amongst the lupus community because. Um, She's a, she was a fighter and she definitely keeps fighting with me, um, you know, so that I can continue my journey and hopefully for many years to come to just keep advocating and put it out there and talk about it. And uh, yeah, so I, I really do appreciate the platform. Like I mentioned earlier, it's great. Well, thank you for saying that we, we, that's, that's the goal, you know, is to lift people up who, suffer from this illness and give them hope. And, uh, you know, you have a guardian angel on your side. And, and I think um, that is certainly going to help propel you to being a healthy lupus advocate and patient and, you know, wish you the best. And, and thanks again for joining the podcast. Of course. Thank you, Adam. On behalf of the entire team at Lupus LA, we thank you for joining the Your Story, Our Fight podcast. Please tune in, spread the word, and come back for more inspiring lupus stories. I'm your host, Adam Selkowitz, wishing you good health, and to always remember, your story is our fight.